Okay. So going back to what I said, uh, I came into this through uh, Mark Tan. He's a, uh, another doctor. He introduced me to Kangen Water. When I first saw the demo, I bought a machine straight away. And the reason why I bought a machine because it had already um, confirmed a lot of things that I had suspected. A very common um, viewpoint, which is that working in the emergency department, we became frustrated with loads of people who come in who are on loads of medications. You must know people. I don't know if any of you know friends or family who, when they go to the doctors or when they go to the hospital, they're on a statin, they're on a high blood pressure pill, they're on a diabetic pill, they're on an arthritic pill, they're on a whole host of pills. Does anybody, put your hands up if you know anybody like that. Seven pills are different. Seven pills. Uh, not me, not me. Not you, but you know people with seven pills. <laughs> so, what is going on, guys? This is not what we signed up for. People have fought wars, and they didn't stay back then on the trench or wherever they came, that when I go to hospital, when I reach the age of 60, I'm gonna be on 10 different pills. This is not what they signed up for. This is not how nature works. So I think what we can safely say is that we're losing the battle against chronic medicine. I think there's a place for medicine in the acute sense. People come in with a cut finger, you stitch them up. People come in with pain, we give them a painkiller, but that's not correct. Painkillers. Anybody have owned a vehicle? Right, loads of you. When the indicator comes up on the indicator panel, it says oil filter. When you take it to the garage, does the guy take a hammer and smash the indicator and say problem solved? It doesn't, does he? He gets to the root of the problem. So when people come in with pain, what we should be looking at is the underlying cause. This is something that we don't do in medicine anymore. We give a painkiller and we send the patient home. So there's clearly something going wrong. So this comes on to why Canyon Water came into this. You see, Canyon Water comes from studies which were done on the most abundant substance in this world, which is water. And what we learned from that is that there are a lot of natural substances in this world which can help us. So for instance, I go back to Islam again. In Islam we have a saying that says, Do you know what that means? It means which of the favors of your Lord do you deny? Which of the favors of your Lord do you deny? It's a very powerful statement because what it's telling you is that God has created plants, He's created water, He's created all the things that you would need to help you in your health. But what do you do? You deny, 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 deny. We don't want fresh foods and vegetables. We want McDonald's. <laughs> we want burger. We want chips. We want KFC. This is the reality of the world we live in. And this is the problem. So we have come a long way from where we should be going. The compass heading of medicine has changed direction. In the old days, who was the father of medicine? Anybody? Who was the father of medicine? Hippocrates. Hippocrates. What did Hippocrates used to say? Let thy medicine be thy food, let thy food be thy medicine. We have come a long way from that. Now we, re we, we rely on uh, drugs, um, to try and help us. But there, I'm not going to say that that's wrong. There is a place for that. And it does help. But I have a problem when you have to put people on medications for long term. Clearly there's something going wrong. That has to change. So for an acute situation, yes. Somebody comes in with a very, very raging infection. You give them antibiotics for a while, come off it, and they go back to normal. But they have to change something. So, two years ago, I was on this stage, well not this stage particularly, but I was addressing you. And one of the things I said was, can anybody remember what I said? Anyone who remembers me from two years ago? Go on, what did I say? Uh, one year back, we met, in we met one year back, yeah. But two years ago I came here and I said, I would like to apologize on behalf of the medical profession to the people who have suffered as a result wow. of some of the things that we have done. Wow. Now, do you know 
know what I did two years ago? Two years ago, myself and Mark Tan, we decided that we were going to embark on a journey together. And that journey was to go and do a course in naturopathic medicine. Today, I can call myself a qualified nutritional therapist. I got that, I got that literally last month. I got the, the qualification. So I'm a doctor as well as a natural, naturopathic nutritionist. So now, I have both sides of the coin at my armamentarium when I treat patients. So when I have patients who come in, I don't just sit there, take a tablet, go home. I say, come and sit down, let's talk. Let's get to the bottom of why you have this problem. Yes? Right. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to try and take you through the journey through Kangen Water and try to explain to you some of the things or some of the, try to, try to alleviate some of the issues or some of the questions that usually get asked. We'll start with the number one. A lot of people say to me, why is it that Kangen Water, we haven't got any studies or things like that to support was a question that one of you asked me yesterday. Why can't we do some more studies to try to show that Kangen water is so powerful and it has all these miraculous things? The problem is, is conflict of interest. You see, we live in a society now where we, or the medical profession, relies on evidence-based medicine. And evidence-based medicine is a very good paradigm. It's very, very important. You need evidence to support why it is that we're going in a particular direction. The problem comes with who's funding that call? Who is actually going to be funding that study? Right. So when you have people who are funding it, there's a conflict of interest. Well, there's a possible conflict of interest. We don't want to mention any names, but it's something that you should be aware of. Yeah. The second thing is, whatever it is that you decide to study should be measurable. Yes? So measurable means, for example, if you have a drug which has been manufactured, there is a formula for that drug. So they take that drug and now they put it through a test. And they test it in all the people in the room and they divide the room up and say we have a control and we have the people who we've tried it on and we see the differences. The problem when it comes to doing things or using things which are natural is that we don't actually know what's in it. What, for example, an apple, what does an apple contain? Apple contains, would you believe apple contains salicylates? If you take three apples a day, it's you could have taking one aspirin. But what else has the apple got in it? Vitamin. Correct, vitamin C, vitamins, sodium. It's got loads and loads of different elements but we can't actually put a chemical symbol or a diagram to it. Who is the greatest biochemist? Allah, exactly. God. So he has created this apple, which has in it substances which you know, and substances which you haven't even heard of yet. So when you take something like water, which comes from your tap, and you put it through the canyon machine, what are you getting out of it? Water. What? Okay. So what is water? Is it just H2O? What else is it? <laughs> Magnesium, calcium, zinc, phosphorus, sulfur, you name it, every element is in it. And then we talk about hard water. Now hard water's got even more minerals in it. You see where the confusion comes? We cannot measure it. So when you try to put that forward as a point of study, can you see the multifactorial issues you're going to have? You can't control that. Now, there's another conflict of interest. And it goes something like this. It's based on a concept which says that the only cure for a disease is a what? And that was made law. Do you know what the implications of that sentence is? How many implications can you see? The first implication is on the word drug. The 
second invocation is on the word disease. Yeah. And the third one is only, only cure. I'll tell you. I'll give you a scenario. What this means is, who makes the drug? Pharma. Pharmaceutical company. Right. right. Who defines the disease? Thank you. That's where we come in. Right. So we're part of this. We define the disease. As a matter of fact, we have a book called the ICD-10. And in the ICD-10, it lists all the diseases known. Now, did anybody ever know anybody who went to school years ago, or even now, who knew anybody who used to disrupt the class? There's always one, isn't there? There's always one idiot. <laughs> right. Right. Do you know what they call that guy now? What's the condition that they associate with him or her? ADD. ADD, no, ADHD. 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 <coughs> Attention, deficit, hyperactive disorder. Now they call that a disorder, which is kind of synonymous with the word disease. What do you think, what do you think that means now? We have now defined, now in the old days it was just a disruptive child. Now we've put a label on it. Now, we have a disease which the only cure for is a drug. Do you see what we've done? I'll give you another example. Anybody here in this room suffer from uh, a problem where they go to the toilet and have loose stool and the, the bowel habits are all over the place? Anybody? That's good because you guys are eating good food. <laughs> <laughs> in the Western world, there are people who come in with diarrhea, constipation, diarrhea. You know what we call that? Irritable bowel disease. Right, so there are two conditions which have now come into our world in the last, in the last century, last decade. Last, yeah, last, these past two decades. These two conditions. What this means now is we can now create a drug to target these two things because we now know that we have a cure. Only cure. You see how this works now financially? You see the system? This is what we are having for. This is what you guys are going to be faced with when you go out there and start promoting Chang and Water. This is, this is the issue. See? So, only cure. So, when somebody like Granny Smith decided that she wanted to promote her apples and said, you know what? If you eat these apples, it's going to help you with your heart disease. Do you know what they could do to poor Granny Smith? They can lock her up. You know why? Because she's selling an unlicensed drug. <laughs> can you imagine? <laughs> Granny Smith! <laughs> what did she do? <laughs> so this is the this is the society we, we, we live in. This is what we've done to our society. We've now come into a situation where things become absolutely ludicrous. So, where does this come into Canyon? You ask. Well, um, what we have to do now is we have to sit down and think. Where does water come into this? Well, water, as we know, is one of the most abundant um, substances in our world. It covers approximately 70% of the Earth's surface. It also is in 95% of all of you. Water exists, right? So. What we need to now try to do is to understand why is canyon water different from normal water? And you guys have all seen the demo, haven't you? Yes. yes. Right. So all of you are going to be able to tell me what the three properties of canyon water are. One? Alkalinity. Alkalinization. Two? Microclustering. Microclustering. Three? Oxidative. anti Right. Okay. Now, do we really truly understand what those three things are? No. Somebody said no. <laughs> well, guys, you're in trouble. <laughs> you don't even know why. <laughs> okay, so you have something called a pH scale. Yes? pH scale is pH. Right, let's write that up. Which time pH. Now, P is a mathematical term, right? That means negative logarithmic concentration of. 
That's what P stands for. H stands for? Hydrogen. Hydrogen. Yes? Negative logarithm. As a matter of fact, this is actually a misnomer. It's not hydrogen. It contains plus. Protons. Yes? So it's the protons. It's the concentration of protons in a substance. That's effectively what it means. Okay? And if there's a lot of it, if there's a lot of it, there's loads and loads and loads and thousands of it, we describe that solution as an acid. Now because we use the word negative, logarithmic, the pH is going to be high or low? No. no. Okay. See, when you have a pH of 1 or 2, that is means that this is very high. So alkaline means when the pH is high, say 11.5, 14, this is low. So do you all understand now why the pH, what it means, the pH? You've got an idea now, yeah? So this is what you're measuring in the water. So you have alkaline water and you have acidic water. Right. Now, the next thing we should try to work out is um, antioxidation. But before we do that, let me just qualify a few things. When you drink this water, where does it go? It goes into the stomach. Where else does it go? It goes into the cells and everything else. Because we're jumping ahead because we know about microcluster, yeah? So microcluster is where it actually goes. You did the test with the tea bag, it goes in and it dissolves into all the whole body. As a matter of fact, as soon as those water touch your lips, they get absorbed into the cells. That's why it takes 30 to 60 seconds to reach the head, the brain. Okay? So it's like a sponge. If you imagine a sponge, you add the water here, it goes through the whole system. That water is so powerful, it can penetrate every cell. Because as we know about Dr. Agre, Peter Agre, yes? channels, the aquaporin channels, you know all about that. Okay, good. So the water gets through the system very easily. So with that in mind, when you drink this water, it goes straight to the body, it goes through all the cells. What we need to try to understand, first of all, is the composition of the body. And that comes on to this. How many liters of water in a 70 kilogram nail? Yeah. In liters? How many liters? So we've got 3.5. Anybody got a higher than that? So you think that we have 3.5 liters of water in a 70 kilogram layer, is that right? Any advances on that? 3.3 actually. 50? How much? 45. 45. Right. 45 liters of water in a 70 kilogram layer. 45 liters. Right. I think whoever said 3.5 is getting confused with blood. Yes? Well, how, many how, many liters, was how, many, well, how many liters of blood is there in the body? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> more, more than 45 liters? 70, 70 liters. 70 liters, I think. 3.3 liters. 3.3 liters. Okay, that's good. Right. Okay. So we've got 3.5 liters of water in a 70 kilogram What's my next question going to be? No, my next question is going to be, is where the hell is the other 40 liters? You've <laughs> <laughs> got five in the blood, where's the rest? Right. You have what's known as, right, you have what's known as, the, how many cells are there in the body? 60. Right. So between 37 and 70 trillion cells in the body. Okay? Now each one of those cells is, is, is what a cell is, a compartment. And each of those compartments contain fluid. If you add up all of that, all of the fluid in those cells, you arrive at the figure of 25 liters, intracellular space. Where's the rest? So you've got 15, which is in the extracellular space. That, ladies and gentlemen, is how the water is distributed in the body. Yes? Now we'll come on to how much you drink. You know what Right. So when you drink this water, that water is going to be evenly distributed throughout those systems, in the blood, intracellularly, and extracellularly. That's how the water is getting there. Okay? And we know that it has the microcluster capability, that's why it's getting... So where does the majority of that water go? Cellular. Intracellular space, exactly. The majority of it is going to go in intracellular space. What does that mean for the cell? Right, we'll come on to that. So, 
What we will now talk about is, does anybody know what the normal pH of blood is? 7.365. Who? 7.365. So it's actually a range. It's usually 7.35 to 7.45. That's the normal pH of blood. Right? So can you now see? Now, incidentally, 7.35, is that more positive? Sorry, is that more White. alkaline than neutral or more acidic than neutral? White. It's more alkaline than neutral. So does this go back to the question now, who in their right mind decided that tap water, which is neutral pH, was the right water to drink? <laughs> who in their right mind decided that? Yeah. So straight away, we've already won the argument. How can water is better? Right? When a baby is born in amniotic fluid, when you measure the pH of the amniotic fluid, is it acidic or alkaline? Yeah. So 7.35 to 7.45 is the normal pH of blood. Now, does anybody know what happens if you go to the extremes? Supposing it's some, your pH when you measure it is 6.9. What happens? Acidosis. 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 And for all of those people that don't know what acidosis is, it actually puts the body in a shock. It actually causes the body to start doing some weird stuff. Yeah? The same thing happens at the other extreme. So when you have people coming up to you saying, oh, if I drink alkaline water, it's going to make my blood go strong, oh, I'm going to go into acidosis, it's not going to be the case. Because where is the majority of the water going? Inter cellular. Right? And everybody knows that all the cells in our body, they're all ha they all have specified jobs to do. What is one thing? For example, in the stomach, in the lining of the stomach, what is the normal pH of the stomach? <coughs> Can be the lowest two, 3.5. So it's very, very highly acidic. So when you have those kinds of, and, on, and in the saliva of the tongue, does anybody know the pH of the saliva of the tongue is? So straight away, we've identified two different areas of the body where the pH is highly different. So it's not a constant. It doesn't need to be a constant. But the blood has to be constant. Why does it have to be constant? Because the blood is traveling around the body. You see? So that doesn't get affected. And as we've already established, only five liters. The water doesn't go all the way into the blood. It goes into all this. So can you see now that when you drink pH 9.5 or 11.5, it's not going to alkalize the blood? to the point that it goes. So, I hope this will clear up the confusion when you see a dietitian or a doctor alike and they talk about alkalizing the body. Yeah? Does alkalizing the body mean alkalizing the blood? No. no. It means alkalizing the cells, of which we have millions of or trillions of. Yeah? So I hope that clears that up. So this is the pH system. This is how it's distributed. And, um, so that's why hanging water has the benefits that it does, because this now comes back to a guy called Otto Heinrich Warburg. Yes? And what did Otto Heinrich Warburg say about cells? Cancerous cells. They are acidic. But... Right, exactly. So, the, so what you have to do is you have to try and create an alkaline environment. This is why he insists on trying to alkalinize the body. Because if you alkalize the body, then you can reduce the risks Yes. And remember, I said reduce the risks. Yes? Now, that brings me on to a testimonial. Sorry, guys. Right, that brings me on to a testimonial. Myself and Mark Tam, we had a dilemma. We had a situation where a lady who Mark has seen, she was a 55 year old lady who was diagnosed with stage 3 lymphoma. And if all of you, any of you don't know what that is, it's basically cancer which has got to a stage where there isn't pretty much any comeback. She's only been given three weeks to live. Yeah. So she came to us in December of 2014. And uh, what she said was, was that she had had three cycles of chemotherapy, all had failed. No, actually, wrong. The third chemotherapy was fine. She actually uh, improved. But then after two months, the doctors turned around and said to her, I'm very sorry to tell you this, but the cancer cells have come back. And we can only offer you chemotherapy. And the problem is, is if we offer you chemotherapy, there's only a 25% chance of survival. She decided she had enough. 
Because if anybody's ever known about chemotherapy, it's a very rigorous process, and people can get very, very ill and very, very sick. And she said that's it. And put my affairs in order, call it a day. A very, very heartfelt text message which she sent. So myself and Mark, knowing what we knew, and knowing that we just started our journey in naturopathic medicine, we decided to approach her and we said, listen, we're going to try and offer you something, uh, a solution, literally. And she said, well, what could you possibly offer me? You could see the, hear the frustration in her voice. You know, the husband, the husband was actually a, a, a chemist. So he was very skeptical when we started talking about this. So anyway, we said to her, listen, we went in Trump style, what have you got to lose? <laughs> what have you got to lose? <laughs> I know it sounds really bad, but we hear that, it just goes out. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, that's with the Trump, anyway, let's go So anyway, so what happened was she decided, she said, okay, I'll try anything. So we went, we explained the rationale. Explained exactly what I explained to you guys about alkalinizing the body, the cells, and everything else. So we said to her, why don't you try drinking pH 11.5? Right. Now, Simon earlier gave 15 uh, benefits of Kanga, didn't he? Yes. Right. I'm going to throw a 16th one in there. <laughs> Do you know what that is? Kangen water is the only water endorsed by the American Cancer Institute. Yeah, that one. So, what we did was, we sat down and we said to her, listen, try this. Drink pH 11.5. We explained the rationale, that, you know, what, 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 why she should do it. And she said, okay, fine. That's what she did. We also asked her to change a few things in her diet. Now, I'll throw in a disclaimer in there. Water is only part of the story. Right? I'll come back to that. But the next thing is your nutrition. Get the water right. You all are very privileged to know that the water that you have is the best water that you're going to come across. Take advantage of that. And another question I would throw into you, you heard uh, Simon going about BMWs and Mercs and Mercs and all that. What I would say to you guys is why would you want to compromise on your health? I think that deserves a round of applause, isn't it? Yeah. Why would you want to compromise on your health? If you're going to spend, spend in the way of Allah and spend in the way of trying to help yourself. Anyway, we'll come more than that. Right, 11.5. So what we did was we started her on the five liters of water. She started drinking five liters of water. Within, so this was now, we were in the beginning. First, we were in the first week of December. Can you believe in January 2015, she came back to us. She said she went to see her oncologist and the oncologist was shocked to discover that the cancer cells of one half of the body had gone. <laughs> She had a lump in her neck, right? Two weeks after that, the lump went down. I was drinking kind of got back. The other thing they make you do when you're a cancer patient is they do yoga classes and all these things. She never could last more than 20 minutes in the yoga class. And these yoga classes you should go for an hour. She was able, at the end, to actually be able to last throughout the whole yoga class. Then she started, a week after that, she started doing uh, some, uh, what do you call it, digging holes in the back, she was, she was working on her allotment. This was a lady who was bedridden, from bedridden within two months was started digging in the gardens, planting, planting plants and all this kind of stuff. But every story always has a negative connotation to it. And it can be quite heartbreaking for some people, it can be a setback for some people, but sometimes a setback can also be something to learn from. What happened, the family got so excited, do you know what they decided to do? They went off and bought a competitive machine. <laughs> X, X box or X machine or whatever. So they went and bought this X machine. Yeah? It was cheaper. So she started drinking that. She didn't drop start. She stopped the canyon altogether. What do you think happened in two months? Get back in. All the cancer cells came back. So it just goes to show that, you know, that for us was heartbreaking because we thought, well, she's obviously not coming back. And you see, at the end of the day, we live in a world where everybody has free will. You can't deny free will. Everybody has free will. They can do what they want. But again, it's about learning from other people's mistakes. Is that right? Yeah. Not what Danny said earlier? Yeah. It's learning from other people's mistakes. So, um, so, there, so this is what happened. So then, two months later, she decided she'd had enough. She came, she got rid of that machine. She bought the Canyon machine. She installed it. And guess what happened? She went into complete remission. Wow. <laughs> So it just goes to show that, you know, out of every, every cloud of the silver lining, and she, you know, there's a good tale to tell from that.
But this is the thing. This is not to say that, this is not to endorse Kangen and say that Kangen is the cure for all cancers. We can't say that. Because every cancer is different. Okay? It's part of the equation. I always say, start off with one thing, the next element in the cosmos. Well, how many elements are there? How many elements are there? It always used to be five, yeah? Air, water, fire, earth, and ether. Water is the first one, the next one is earth. Now you're gonna start looking for the right nutrients. Because when you get the right nutrients, and you can build yourself up. That's it. So, um, 30 to go? Okay. So, we've talked about the uh, pH, and we've seen how it can be beneficial in cancer cells. Because we know about Otto Heinrich Warburg's work, we know about what Kangen can do, we know that Kangen has the capability of producing pH 11.5. Do we know why? pH 11.5 is different from pH 9.5. I think Simon explained that to you guys. It's the sodium. It's the sodium hypochlorite solution that pushes the pH even higher. Yes? So now you get sodium hydroxide. And that sodium hydroxide, ladies and gentlemen, in the pH 11.5 is what allows that water to emulsify fats. Yes? So the emulsification of fats is because of that property. The other thing we know about pH 11.5, it draws pesticides out of the vegetables and fruits. And we've demonstrated that. And from what I've heard, there's a study that shows that that has actually been shown. Yes? Does anybody in this room know, and I haven't heard it all day today, or maybe I missed it, what does Kangen mean? Back to origin. Back to origin. Can you see now how powerful Kangen water is? Yes. What does it do to our fruits? It takes the fruits back, back to origin. How does it do that? Because when Allah created the fruits and vegetables, they were intended to be eaten as they are. Now, yes, we did cook some, and we've learned through years of following our ancestors what we should do. But these fruits and vegetables, did God say, let's add pesticides to thy fruit? <laughs> he didn't say that, did he? That's where man came in. Man has completely screwed the whole thing up, didn't he? <laughs> so today, my, my mother, she's from Guyana, South America. Yeah, that's where she's from. And in Guyana, South America, she lives in a, in a land, in a, she used to live on a farm, where we used to have mangoes, coconuts, uh, five fingers, sapodilla, all of these wonderful fruits we used to have in the back. Not a single one of them had pesticides. They all used to grow freely, wild. And you used to pick the fruit and eat the fruit. Long have we gone from the days when we used to do that. Now what happens is, they have to put pesticides on. You know, there's a man with a big, you know, it always laughs. When I, I don't know if you've ever seen the demo. There's a demo with the one with the guy wearing a mask, and he's got this huge thing, and he's spraying it everywhere. I think to myself, I look at that, I look at that, it's like from a side, it's like one of these side, side fight. And then we go, and I'm just like, oh, yeah. Like that. I think to myself, but that guy is there with a mask. He sprayed all that shit all over it, and you're going to go and eat it. Anyway. So what we should be doing is, we need to do what? We need to take the fruit back to origin, back to the way it was intended. How do we do that? By washing it in Kangen water, and take the Kangen water takes the fruit back to origin, how it was meant. So you see now how powerful that is? That's what, that's what we should be doing. Right, so, we've talked about pH. The next thing we should talk about, to clear up a few misunderstandings, is, um, now, there's another thing I also picked up. Um, now, the other thing is the machine has its own cleaning mechanism. Yes? And it cleans all of the hard water and, yeah? Do you, do you know another thing you can do instead? Well, you, not instead, but there's another thing you can do. When you put that machine on clean, or when it does its cleaning, what it does, it reverses the polarity and it actually feeds acidic water down the pipe that you normally have alkaline water in. And that dissolves all of the stuff, all of the hard water. So what you can do sometimes when you wake up in the morning, if you've got your machine there, you can put it on pH 5.5 and let that run. And that will also clean the plates. If you look after your machine, your machine will look after you. Yes? Right. Now there's another fundamental thing that I learned over the last three, four years. Can anybody tell me in what form was the most powerful source of energy exist in the universe? Water. He says water. Active hydrogen. 
Anybody else? Oxygen. The human mind. Simple, the human mind. <laughs> well, human, the human mind is corrupted. You're right. <laughs> Amen. It's love, guys. Love. That is what the most powerful source of energy exists in the form of love. Yes? And you know why? Because if you give out love, what has to happen? It has to come back to you. Yes? If you give out love, it has to come back to you. It's not a question of when. It's not even a question of if. But what you must, 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 must never do is what? You must not expect. And this is what you were saying earlier. Yes? If you give out love, you have to give it from the heart, you have to be sincere, but don't expect anything back. Now the reason why I raise that issue now is because now we're going to talk about active hydrogen. <laughs> H2O. Now we already established that water is not just H2O, but just for simplification, we'll just say H2O is water, right? Now, when this goes through the tanking machine, what does it become? Anything else? Come on guys, what's the most, what's the secret ingredient in the Kangen water? Yeah, sodium. Sodium? Come on, yeah. <laughs> what is the most, what's the secret ingredient? <laughs> Active hydrogen, H2. Right. This is the secret weapon in Kangen water. H2. Right? Now, what we have up here is a periodic table. Where did that come from? Right. So, little periodic table up here. Now, H2. H plus the size for that. Now, how do we get this? Anybody have any ideas how we get this? How does this become this? H plus H minus. Right. What we have to first of all do is we have to understand what each of these things are. What is H plus? What is this? It's also called a proton. Now, H is the first element in the periodic table. How many neutrons does a hydrogen have? One. <laughs> oh. Zero. Neutrons in hydrogen, right? Zero. What's the what's the what's the atomic number? One. So one of what? So hydrogen has one electron and one proton. We That's got it. many protons here. Hey. <laughs> H has one electron and one proton. It has a charge of zero. zero. Yes? One electron to balance one proton. Yeah, that's why it has a charge of zero. When it gets a positive charge, the electron disappears and we're left with just a proton. It's very important you understand this. Because if you understand this, then you'll understand the whole thing, how it works. Yeah? This is what H is. Right. Now, <coughs> To get from this to this, what has to happen? You have to gain an electron. What is that called? Is that oxidation or reduction? Right. So you, you guys know about oil ring. Oxidation. Reduction potential. Oxidation is loss. Reduction is yeah. Oil rig. O I L. Oil rig. Oxidation is lost. So this has to gain an electron to become this. So that is a reduction. Yes? That's a reduction step. For this to go back to that, that's an oxidation step. Right. Now, what are we talking about? We're talking about antioxidants. Does anybody know what a free radical is? <clears throat> what is a free radical? No googling, guys. <laughs> it's an atom, an ion, or a molecule that is very, very powerful. And it can cause massive, massive, massive damage. And do you know why it causes damage? 
because it's unhappy. Yes? It's unhappy. Dakar, if I was to take some money from you and steal it, how would you feel? Sad. You'd be upset, wouldn't you? And then you would take it from him, and then Surajit will take, take it from him, and it will cause a massive chain reaction. It's all because of free radical. Me, I was the free radical. I upset you, you upset him, it went around. That's how free radicals work. Now, does anybody know who the usual suspects are? Well, you've got the whole list there, guys. Come on, choose which one. Who are the usual suspects? Right. You've got to go to group seven. These guys. Now, these guys here are the ones who are potential for free radicals, and I'll explain why. So, if we go to group seven, right? Ignore the nine, but you have seven groups. When you get to this group here, fluoride, it looks like this. Fluoride, we won't talk about neutrons, protons, because I just I know you guys got the neutron wrong, so we'll talk about electrons. <laughs> <laughs> electrons, it's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Is this guy happy? No. Why not? Lone Ranger. It's unhappy because its electron is unpaired. This stuff is lethal. Now, I'm going to say this again for the benefit of the people who are not here, because I was criticized for this last year, because whoever was here last year, somebody criticized me and said I should have said it, and say it again, just don't <laughs> Fluoride is the most electronegative element in the periodic table. Yeah. Give a round of applause for that, come on. Yeah. Um, come on. It's the most electronegative because this one here, I'll tell you why it's electronegative. Because it has all these neutrons and protons in here that pulls the cloud very, very tight. Yes? But this thing here is dying to pair up with something. So what this will do is it will ricochet off the inside walls of your vessels and cause damage. I heard the last speaker said something about the water helps with the DNA. It helps to help repair the DNA. Well, this is one of the things. What these free radicals do is they can damage DNA. Yes? Through this process. Now, chloride, chloride, what changes this to a chloride is when you add another shell and do the same thing again, and this time you have one electron here. So chloride is also a potential free radical. So these are your usual suspects. Now, what did I say before about, what? What did I say before about uh, the most powerful source of energy in the universe, what we have to do? What should we do? We should give? Love. Now we come on hydrogen. <laughs> hydrogen has this, but active hydrogen likes to share. This is what H2 looks like, share these electrons, and it exists in the form of a gas. So when you go and fill up your canyon pH 9.5, what do you see inside? Bubbles. What are those bubbles, guys? Active hydrogen. Hydrogen gas. Yeah. Now that water is going to go inside your body, and that active hydrogen is now going to split apart, yes, into this and this. Sorry about the diagram, you will see this. Yeah. Now this is going to go and share this and neutralize this. And it's going to neutralize it by sharing an electron with that one, and it's going to neutralize it. This is what I mean about giving, yes? You go, so if you gave me some money, we would have this problem in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not giving, guys. <laughs> so this is what active hydrogen does. It splits apart and it goes and neutralizes the free radicals and it keeps the general consensus that everybody's calm, everybody's love, everybody's happy. So that's how anti antioxidants work. This is what active hydrogen is. That's why kangaroo was the most So now you know how, how it works as an antioxidant. It's going to go there, it's going to, it's going to donate its electrons and say, hate me. And that's it. It neutralizes the radicals. So that's the antioxidant story. Yeah? We come on to the last one, which is microcluster. Now, microcluster is a little bit difficult because you're going to come across some guy who's a scientist and he's going to listen to you do your tea bag test and you're going to tell him that water can exist in small molecules and he's going to tell you things. <laughs> it, it, it does not, it's not recognized in the scientific world. It's not. And I think the reason for that is, is because they do not actually appreciate that active hydrogen, H2 on its own, will penetrate the cells. That's what we're coming to the conclusion of. So when you do your T-back test, it does actually penetrate the cells. It's, it, it does have that capability. And I'll tell you why, because 
I just heard of an experiment only today where if you take a bag of just tap water and measure the ORP inside, the ORP will be positive. Take that bag and place it into, into another bottle with pH 9.5 in, and then measure the ORP in the center, the ORP will be negative. Because the active hydrogen goes across into that and produces the negative ORP. Now, do we understand what ORP is? What does ORP stand for, guys? Right. It's another thing we're going to clear up. If some of you think that this water somehow has some voltage power or some stuff in it, right? <laughs> Let's be clear what ORP is, okay? ORP is a measure of the oxidation reduction potential. What it actually is measuring is, a, is, is measuring a relationship. It's measuring the relationship between the product, which is H2, yes? And the, pro and the precursor to that. Does anybody know what the precursor is? I already explained this to you. H plus, press on. If you add an electron to this, what does H plus become? H. H. One electron. H. It becomes H. And then an H then migrates with another H and becomes H2. So that's how you get this. So what the ORP is doing, it's measuring the relationship between H2 and H plus. So when you get your water, which has your pH 9.5 in, right, which is alkaline, which has all the bubbles in it, which has all the H2 in it, how many protons are in that? Is there a lot of protons or is there the least group of protons? Least. Not a lot. Why? Think about it. Least. What did we say earlier about pH? pH is when you, if the pH is low, it's acidic, and that means you have an abundance of protons. When you have alkaline water, it's alkaline. There's not enough protons in it, it's very least. So the proton is less. So this is less, and this is more. So the relationship between this creates a negative ORP. That's why when you measure the ORP in the pH 9.5, this relationship creates a negative ORP. So what it actually means is, is that the substances in here have the ability to act as antioxidants. Yeah. It means that they can actually have reducing power. So this is why the ORP is important for that. So this, I hope this explains why. So ORP is the relationship between the precursor and the products. And the relationship is, is your low proton, a lot of active hydrogen, and that relationship creates a negative result. And that negative result now tells everybody that this water or this substance has antioxidant properties. I hope that answers the question about the ORP. Right. ORP, what else have you got? Right. So we've done ORP. Microfluster we've done. I think we're nearly there, aren't we? What else have you got? Um, Microclusters. Microclusters. Yeah, microclusters we said before. The active hydrogen in the water, as I said, the water, go back to this one. This diagram here shows you the water of all the species that we're producing. Right, H2O produces H plus, it produces hydroxide ions, and it produces H2. These are the three species that you're going to get in Kangen water. You do not get this in normal tap water. All you get in tap water is this. What does this look like? It looks like this. That's what this looks like in the water. And then you also have this, H plus and OH minus. And then these form hydrogen bonds. That's why the water is a very good conductor of electricity. Yeah? But what you also get is H2. This is the stuff that travels across the membrane. And then when it gets into the next water, it will also produce more H2 and less protons, and then the ORP will become negative in that. Mm. So this is what's actually causing it. The active hydrogen is the key. That's the thing that gets across the membranes. So that's your 